Follow me. Two words every soul in creation is confronted with. A command. A verdict with eternity as its gift. Follow me, Jesus says, and deny yourself. Pick up your cross, baptize, and make disciples of all nations. This world will persecute you. But seek him, proclaim him, acknowledge him before men here on earth. Be reconciled, innocent, raised again to a new life. Follow me, he says, and you will know the Father. This is what it looks like to truly follow Jesus. Well, good morning. It is good to see you guys, and happy Mother's Day to all the moms in the room. I hope you guys have a fantastic day. We're in a series that we're calling Life on the Mountain, and uh, it's a series that we're working our way through in the Gospel of Matthew. You can turn there if you've got your Bibles. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 5, and Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is, is what's traditionally called the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, what we're talking about in this series is what does it look like to follow Jesus? Uh, Jesus is on top of this mountain. He's overlooking the Sea of Galilee. He's got his disciples there, and uh, he, he teaches them essentially the basics of what it means to follow him. And we're calling it Life on the Mountain because obviously he's on top of a mountain when he teaches this, but, but also we wanted to give you a visual because it's kind of like being on top of a mountain. The, the, the climb to the top of the mountain is rigorous, it's hard, it's difficult, it's challenging, but the views are amazing when you get there and uh, the, the rewards are eternal. And so the, the mentality that we want you guys to begin to think about in this series is that you can choose to live life on the mountain. Life on the mountain doesn't have anything to do with your circumstances. Uh, because it doesn't matter if things are going well for you or if things are not going well for you. We're not saying you're in the valley if things aren't going well. What we're saying is you and I can choose to live like Jesus. You and I can choose to live life on the mountain. So it doesn't matter what you and I are actually experiencing. Um, here's, here's the statement that we keep saying through this series. Life in the valley is focused on me and life on the mountain is focused on we. And so anytime I am living my life like Jesus, anytime I am fulfilling the call that he has in my life and I'm modeling my life after him, I'm focused on we, I'm focused on other people. But anytime I begin to focus on me and myself, I'm essentially coming off that mountain and then I begin to live in the valley. And so that's essentially what we're, we're beginning to, to, to discuss and talk about through the life of this series. You, you and I can choose this. Living life on the mountain means that we are living like Jesus. And so today we're going to uh, begin in verse 17 and it's probably the most transformational verse in the entire Sermon on the Mount. I mean, what we're going to look at today actually changes everything. It changes how we relate to God. It changes how we relate to the Old Testament. Everything changes because of the next few verses. And so uh, I think it's uh, important that we kind of focus on it today. And what I really want to teach you today uh, from the Gospel of Matthew is what really changed. Everything changed, but what is the main change that actually takes place? Now, for, for many of us, when it comes to the Old Testament, um, we don't really know how to deal with it. Um, the life of, of a Christian is kind of balanced on this. We live in the New Testament, but we read the Old Testament, and we see a lot of things in the Old Testament that we're not really quite sure what we're supposed to do with. Uh, we take some points from the Old Testament and say, yeah, This is something that we need to do and make everybody do this. And then we just kind of ignore some of the other parts of the Old Testament. For instance, let's talk about the Sabbath for a minute. In the Ten Commandments, uh, God says to keep the Sabbath holy, to take a rest and to keep it holy. And so when we look at that in the New Testament, we see people today, you got to, you got to, you know, do the Sabbath and this kind of thing. And it's like, okay, well, well, what does that mean? And, and, And most of the Christians I know aren't following it and aren't doing it as prescribed in the Old Testament because in the Old Testament, it was a Saturday. Right? And so we don't, we don't, Saturday, you mowed the grass and you took your kids to ball games all over town. You didn't rest, right? So does that mean that you failed to fulfill the, the, the Sabbath? I mean, just, just, just think, okay, well, maybe we can flip it and say, well, Sunday's the Sabbath now. Okay, well, 
guess what? You've already worked really hard this morning, haven't you? Um, you had to get your kids ready. You had to get your husband ready. Can I get an amen, moms? You had to get everything put together so that you could get here on time. And that takes a lot of daggum work, doesn't it? I mean, you're running around and you're getting the kids ready. And then all of a sudden you hear your husband say, where are my black socks at? You take my black socks. And all of a sudden you're, you're arguing about black socks like you're some black th- sock thief, you know. And we got to feed the kids. And yeah, Chick-fil-A is closed because it's the Sabbath, man. We've all been there, right? So now we're upset. We can't have Chick-fil-A. Black socks are gone. We didn't wear any socks today. And we had to feed our kids Pop-Tarts in the car on the way to church. And we're all upset, angry at each other. And we walk in here praising Jesus, right? (laughs) We did a lot of work today to get to this point. So does that mean that you actually didn't keep the Sabbath? Well, we've got to make sense. We, we need to understand how we relate to things in the Old Testament. This kind of thing happens over and over and over again in the church. Christians are really confused about this. And it's not just Christians that are confused. It's actually the culture around us that's really confused as well. I wanted to share a quote by a guy by the name of Sam Harris. He is He's an atheist, and he's, a, he's an author, and in his book, Letter to a Christian Nation, he says, God, in his timeless wisdom, sarcasm there, just to make sure you know that, commanded that we must stone people to death for heresy, adultery, homosexuality, working on the Sabbath, worshiping graven images, practicing sorcery, and a wide variety of other imaginary crimes. He further added If we are going to take the God of the Bible seriously, we should admit that he never gives us the freedom to follow the commandments we like and neglect the rest, nor does he tell us that we can relax the penalties he has imposed for breaking them. Now, when you read that from an atheist, as a Christian, you might step back and say, he actually has a point. I mean, when you look at the crusaders in the 11th century, they actually used the Old Testament passages to give them the right to kill Muslims. Um, When you see Christians today taking Old Testament dietary laws and then enforcing them on people today, you can't eat pork and, and you can't, you know, eat shellfish. When you see people today taking Old Testament passages and condemning biracial marriage and no tattoos, and the list is kind of endless on picking and choosing what we want to follow in the Old Testament and then plucking it and putting it down into the New Testament. We've got a lot of confusion going on in the church, and we can't just pick and choose. We have to have a consistent theology Or, like Sam Harris, we're going to live a very confused life and project a very confused life. So, in our Bibles, in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 17, Jesus is actually going to resolve this tension that we face in the church. Here's what he says in verse 17. Do not think I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven." (laughs) Let's look at this again. Unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, that's a scary verse. When I read that, I think now, okay, what exactly is the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees? Because I've got to do better than them, right? There's a lot of college students and high school students here. You're probably taking final exams, and you got a lot of stress, and you're studying, and you know, you got you to gotta potentially, you know, get ready for the ACT score. And some of you are trying to get that, that last scholarship. And in order to get that last scholarship, you got to get a little bit better on the ACT, you know. And sometimes, you know, we could read that verse and think, okay, well, 
The Pharisees scored a 92, so we got to study and work really hard so that we can get a 93, and then we're going to make it, right? Is that what Jesus is actually saying? Of course not. You see, the scribes and the Pharisees had a righteousness that actually made Jesus really, really angry. They had an external righteousness, and because of that external righteousness, Jesus condemned them often. One of the things that they did was they would take Old Testament uh, passages, commands from God, and then they would add to them. For instance, let's go back to the Sabbath, because that's one that, that is, 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 is really difficult for them and for us today. Um, one of the things that they did was, God said, keep it holy and rest. And so their question was, well, what does it mean to actually rest? How do we know if we're working or if we're actually keeping it holy? And so they created a list of rules. They created a list of, of petty rules that they had to follow in order to be considered righteous. One of the, these, these rules was that you were not allowed to take a gulp of milk. You can take a sip, maybe a slurp, but not a gulp. Because if you, if you took a gulp, then that would be considered work and that would mean that you're not fulfilling the law, right? And there were actually pages and pages of these legalistic rules. It's called the Mishnah. There's over 800 pages of these rules. Everything added to what God said. And if you know anything about Jesus and his relationship to the scribes and Pharisees, you know that that infuriated him. In fact, let's read a couple of passages here. In Matthew 25, or 23, verse 25, Jesus says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but the inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and the plate. He continues that the outside also may be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. Jesus is condemning them because everything about their relationship with God was an external, look at me, I'm checking boxes here so that everybody could see just how holy I am. It was all about an external appearance. See, God's standard is, is really impossible for us to accomplish on our own. And, and what they did was they created these traditions because that was easier for them to follow. They were complicated because there were so many of them, but they were tangible. I didn't drink milk today. Box checked. I am righteous. The entire system of all of these legalistic traditions uh, reduces God's standard and elevates our image of our self-esteem. And folks, that's exactly what we struggle with today. You know, Jesus is all the time condemning their outward show of righteousness, and, 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 and that's exactly what we get in trouble with today. We do our best to put on the outward display. Hey, that we look the part, we look good, kids look good. Shut up, don't talk in church. You're going to get it when you get home. You know, because we want everybody to know that we got it under control and we're good, right? And so we, we love to check the box. Went to church, check. I am holy and righteous. Read a Bible verse, check. Right? We go through the list. Why? Because it makes us feel better about ourselves. It doesn't require anything in our heart to change. God is after your heart. Jesus is condemning the Pharisees because all they work on is their outward appearance and their external focus. Jesus is saying, I'm after your heart. I want you to change. Barner Research did a study, and their study in North America revealed that 51% of North American Christians polled all possess attitudes and actions that are more like Pharisees than they are like Christ. I mean, that's typical, right? I mean, our experience is over half of us, you know, it's, it's probably why some of you are in church today and you're like, this is exactly why I don't go to church because I feel like I see all these hypocrites, right? This is what we see often. And then he also found four, only 14% of Christians surveyed reflected attitudes and actions that better resembled the attitudes and actions of Christ. And so this doesn't like shock us, I know, 
But we do have to admit, without pointing our fingers at the people sitting around us, that the problem could be within us right here, right? So what are some of those rules? What are some of those traditions that we've imposed in the, early, in the church today? One of them is baptism. A lot of churches might teach you that you have to be baptized in order to be saved. It's not just faith in Christ, it's faith and you got to get baptized. And only when you get baptized, you can say, well, that's not what the Bible says. But it's a box that we can check and it makes us feel good about ourselves. We also see the Catholic Church teaches faith in Jesus is required for heaven. But it's not just faith in Jesus, it's faith and good works. So I have to have faith and I have to produce a certain amount of good works and then God will accept me. Well, that's not what the the, the New Testament teaches, but it helps us check a box. I'm doing good, so I feel better about myself, right? It's an outward focus. Uh, We mention things like tattoos that are condemned. We've mentioned things that, you know, what women wear, is that Skirt going down to your ankles, young lady. You better be modest or you're, right? It's like, I don't know, not sure where that one came from. What are you watching on TV? You can watch this show, but you better not be watching the Game of Thrones. I'm telling you right now, you're going to hell, right? You can watch The Bachelor for whatever reasons, but you can't watch that one, right? I don't know what to watch, you know? It makes us feel better about ourselves because I can check the box. And every time we check a box, that we feel like is a righteous box. We, we elevate ourselves and we're able to turn our nose down at somebody else because we're holier. And that's essentially what the scribes and the Pharisees are doing. But it's not in our outer righteousness that shows how holy we are. It's not that outer righteousness. It's the inner righteousness that shows how God is so gracious to us. And that's what he's after. Possibly uh, only, only is this possible because he gives us a brand new heart. I, I can't do anything external that would please God outside of a heart that's been transformed by him in the first place. He takes my heart of flesh, my heart of stone, and he gives me a heart of flesh. He gives me a brand new heart when he saves me. And that's what he's after. He's after that heart. Now, how do we get that heart? How are you and I able to experience a transformed heart? Well, look at verse 17 again. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. The way in which that you and I are able to experience a brand new heart and a transformation from the inside out is only because Jesus came and fulfilled the old covenant And he totally gives us the ability to be transformed. The word fulfill means that Jesus is bringing the law to its intended goal. He's he's not throwing away the law. He's actually fulfilling it. He's completing it. Here's what I, I think is important. He came to bring out the real meaning of the law. So think of an acorn. You can smash an acorn and kill it. Or you can take an acorn and put it into the ground, and then it grows into an oak tree. It fulfills its purpose. The seed dies, the acorn dies under the ground, and then it sprouts forth the tree that it was intended to create. And that's the same thing that Jesus is doing with the law. He's not scrapping it. He's not telling us to delete it and burn it. He's saying, I came to bring it to full completion. Now listen, Sam Harris is right if Jesus didn't come to fulfill the law. If Jesus didn't fulfill the law, then you and I need to stone every you know, com- crime that was committed, right? That, that's what we still have to follow. If Jesus didn't fulfill it, we've got about, I don't know, I think there's like 613 laws that we've got to fulfill. The Mishnah, 800 pages that we've got to fulfill. But since Jesus did fulfill the law, it means that everything we read in the Old Testament has to be applied differently. We have to interpret it in light of the cross. We have to interpret it in light of the resurrection. And because Jesus fulfilled the law, everything changed, everything. And the resurrection has provided us with three important truths that we need to celebrate today, that we need to walk in today, we need to walk out of our legalism, 
We got to walk away from the boxes that we like to check, and we need to walk in the freedom of a changed heart that pursues Jesus. And how do we do that? Well, here, here's the first truth. The first thing that Jesus gives us is a new covenant. Because he fulfilled the law and the prophets, the, the Old Testament, he has given us a new covenant. Now, the new covenant, or the old covenant, is, is essentially, I'm going to bless you if you follow my commands. And God made this covenant with the nation of Israel. The Ten Commandments, how to worship him, all the sacrifices, the priesthood, the temple offerings, the festivals, all of that is what Jesus is referring to as the law and the prophets. We call it the Old Testament. It's not called that in the Bible, but that's just the name we gave it. It's not the wrong name, but it's just the name. You could call it the first covenant or the old covenant. You could call it the law and the prophets. It's essentially the Old Testament. And in verse, uh, I think, 19 here, he's saying that not one dot, not one tittle here is, is, is out of place. And what he's essentially saying is he's referring to the smallest Hebrew letter. It's like a dot, and it's, it's like, almost like an apostrophe. And he's saying every single letter, every single dot in an I, every single word of the law and the prophets is inspired by God. It's what we would say is inerrant. There are no errors. So essentially, we're not able to just throw away the Old Testament. We don't just need to burn it. We don't even know who Jesus is if we don't have the Old Testament. We, we need to know the love and the character of God through the verses of the Old Testament. However, when it comes to the Old Testament, we're, we're interpreting it through a different lens, through a different light, because Jesus has come to fulfill the law. Now, what is the purpose of the law? And the purpose, I would say, is really simple. The purpose that God gave the nation of Israel, this law, is to show his holiness, the holiness of God, and the sinfulness of man. You can kind of boil all of the Old Testament law into those two categories. God wanted the nation of Israel to be set apart, wanted them to be holy, wanted them to be different. And so the law was given to them so that they would recognize the holiness of God and recognize the sinfulness of man. Here's a few verses in the New Testament. Paul explains it well in Galatians 3. He says, why then the law? Why do we have it? He said it was added because of transgressions. In other words, it was added because we're, we're sinful. And so because of our sinfulness, God provides in writing a law that shows us that we are sinful. We had to recognize that. And so he showed us what was right and what was wrong. But it was only given until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. The promise is Jesus. So Jesus, again, fulfills it. Here's what Paul says in Romans 3. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. In other words, doing the law, fulfilling the law, not stealing, not killing anybody. You go down the list of all these laws. He's saying just by fulfilling that law and doing those things is not going to earn you heaven. It's not going to happen. You can't do it. He says, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So we can't accomplish it on our own. It's not going to, our works and fulfilling the law is not going to save us, but it does provide us with the knowledge of sin. In other words, we know what is right and wrong because this knowledge of sin has been written on our heart. Romans 1 talks about how every single human being has this written on their heart. It's why everybody has an opinion of what's right and wrong. But we can't truly know right from wrong without the assistance of the Holy Spirit transforming our heart and giving us the law, giving us God's word. So when Jesus says he's fulfilling this old, co uh, old covenant, he's telling you and me that how we relate to this covenant has totally changed. So a helpful thing here is to know a little bit more about the law. I know all the moms woke up wondering, I just wonder, how is the law broken down today? Hang with me. We're going to talk about it. The first way that, that we break it down is, is, is the judicial law or the civil law. So the civil law has everything to do with how you're supposed to dress, uh, all the cleanliness rules. You've got to bathe here. You've got to clean here. Uh, dietary laws, lawsuits, and crime. What do you do when someone commits adultery? All of these things uh, is the civil or judicial laws. And so these were standards the Israelite nation was given to live by God as a chosen nation. But when Jesus comes, he fulfills the law. 
no longer making Israel, listen, his chosen nation. Now the church is the chosen group of people that God is using to bless the world with the gospel. Now, great news for the nation of Israel in Romans 9 through 11. He talks, God talks about how he's going to uh, save a portion in, in a season, in a time, different sermon series, but that will happen uh, for, for some. But how we relate has totally changed. That means, we go back to the same Harris quote, the reason why we're not stoning people is because Jesus fulfilled the law. We don't follow that any longer. The second part of the law is the moral law. So this is morality. You know, how are we to act morally? And so Jesus, or, and so God gives the law to guide them in what is right and what is wrong morally. And so Jesus comes on the scene. He fulfills this portion of the law because of his perfect righteousness and obedience to the law. So the laws of morality are where we must interpret through the lens of the resurrection. Because we've got to understand, okay, this is a moral law or is this a judicial law? Was this just given to, specifically to the Israelites? Or is, is this a principle? Is this a, a, a moral that is true throughout all generations, even under the new covenant? Uh, obviously, some of the morality clauses are don't kill, don't steal. Uh, we know this to be part of, of what we are called to do in the new covenant as well. Here's the third area. The third area is the ceremonial law. So this is all about worship. This is all about uh, the sacrificial system. This is all about temple worship and, and how they were to please God and relate to God in worship. Now, all the sacrificial systems, everything that Israel was a part of in the temple was all pointing to Jesus, and it was fulfilled in Jesus. He was the perfect sacrifice. He brought all sacrifices to an end. And when his sacrifice was made, he declared it is what? Finished. He said, it's finished. Now, why was it finished? When he died on the cross, the veil of the, of the curtain was split in two that separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the, of the temple. Now, why was that? What's the symbolism there? Well, in the Holy of Holies was, was the Ark of the Covenant, which was where the presence of God was. No one was allowed to go into the Holy of Holies in the temple except for the priest, and he only did that one time a year. All throughout the year, they would sacrifice animals and have burnt offerings because they continually sinned against God. But once a year, the priest would go and cover everybody's sins because I'm sure we forgot about something. You know, we, just in case, we're going we're gonna to cover it all. And that was on the Day of Atonement, Yom Kippur. And what the priest would do is he would go through a ritual of ceremonial bathing and he would wear special clothes and, and then he would take a bull and he would sacrifice the bull for his sins and the sins of his family. And he would take the blood of that bull into the Holy of Holies, and he would sprinkle it on what was called the mercy seat, which was the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And then he would take two goats, and one goat he would sacrifice, and that would pay for the sins of the nation of Israel. And he would take the blood from that goat, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. Then he would take the second goat, and he would lay his hands on the head of that goat, and he would transfer the sins of all the nation, all of their sin, um, pre known sin and unknown sin, and he would transfer it onto that goat, and then they would escort that goat out of the city and into the wilderness, thereby removing the sins of the people. And so the first goat paid for the sins, and the second goat carried those sins away. Now, when we look at the life of Jesus, he is the, the, the perfect sacrifice he dies on the cross, and not only does his death pay for our sins, his death carries our sin away. And when the veil was torn, what God was teaching us is that now every single one of you has access to the presence of God. You no longer need a priest. You don't need me for sure. You have direct access to God through our great high priest, Jesus himself. And so Jesus is fulfilling this ceremonial law, and, and, and he's providing a brand new covenant. This is a better covenant. This is a greater 
covenant. Because now, because of his death and resurrection, you and I, when we put our faith and trust in his death and his resurrection, our sins are forgiven, our sins are wiped away, and we have a brand new heart to serve and to worship him. That is a better covenant. Now, not only do we have a new covenant, but secondly, Jesus provides us with a new movement. There's a new movement. It's totally different now in, under this new covenant. Uh, Jesus goes to his, probably one of his best friends, Peter, and he asks Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you're the, you're, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And here's how Jesus responds to him in Matthew 16. Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, you didn't figure this out on your own, but the Father who is in heaven, God gave you the ability to understand this. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is saying, I am the rock. I am going to build my church upon me. Peter, you're going to be the leader. You're going to be the head guy that gets the ball rolling. You're going to lead the disciples, and I am going to build my church. Now, the Greek word there for church is the word ecclesia, and that's important because the word ecclesia in the actual Greek language didn't refer to buildings. It didn't refer to a structure. The word ecclesia, this was not a churchy religious word. The word ecclesia at that time just simply meant a gathering of people, an assembly, people who would gather for a purpose, a congregation. And so all the Greeks were using this word ecclesia to refer to a gathered congregation. So in the 16th century, there was a guy by the name of William Tyndall, and he was the first person to translate from the original languages into the English language. So we owe him a, a debt of gratitude. And when he came to the word ecclesia, he, he, he looked at the German translations, which had already been written. He looked at the Latin Vulgate, which had already been written. And he saw that they translated the word church. And he said, you know what? That's not what the word means. He said, what the word means is the word assembly. And so in his translation, every time he came to this word ecclesia, he translated it as assembly or congregation. Well, you can imagine the Roman Catholic Church did not appreciate that because for them, the church was a structure. It was an organization, and they were in charge, and they were the only ones that could read the Bible, and they, could, they were the only ones that could tell people what, they were, what God was, was, was going to tell them to do. And so they hated him. Once they finally found him, one of his best friends sold him out, and they found him, and they, they strangled him, and they burned his body. But I think he had it right. And I wish it would have stuck. Because fast forward now to 2019, and even in our culture today, when we hear the word church, one of the first things you and I think about is a building, is a place, is a structure, is an organization. But that's not what Jesus meant. Jesus provided us with a brand new movement. He was calling a group of people to gather together with a purpose and that purpose was to share the gospel and to transform the world with that message. So with this message, the implication for you and I is that we, we, we aren't just called to go to church and check a box. We're called to be the church. And as the church, we gather with a purpose, with intentionality. We gather with a certain expectation that God is with us and God is working through us we gather with a sense of urgency that, man, time is short. My life is short. There are people dying and going to hell in this city, and God has gathered this assembly together for the purpose of sharing the gospel with them. It's a movement. It's not a building. I invite you, if you are not connected here, to take that first step and get connected because we have a lot of work to do. Finally, the third thing that Jesus gives to us because he fulfilled the law and the prophets, is he gives us a new command. He gives us a brand new command. Now, what is this command? It's pretty simple. It's not easy to do, but he says in John 13, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Listen to this. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. 
So you're telling me, Jesus, that the people in this community are going to know that I follow you based on how I love the people in this room? Yeah. But Lord, they're mean sometimes. They're ornery sometimes. I'm called to love them. You're, I'm busy, Lord. You know, I got stuff to do. But I got kids, I've got stuff, and so I don't have time to do a lot of loving outside of, you know, my, my little curtain climbers here. By your love for one another, the world will know that you're a follower of Jesus. You see, the rest of the Sermon on the Mount is Jesus taking some moral clauses in the Old Covenant, and he elevates that standard. He raises the standard, and he says, this is what it means to follow me. Following me, following Jesus 101, basic Christianity stuff. Do you love people? Basic Christianity stuff is what we're going to see over the next few weeks. Do you struggle with anger? How do you deal with it? Do you struggle with lust? As a follower of Jesus, here's how you deal with it. How's your marriage today? Not very good? Here's what it means to make a commitment to someone Jesus is going to tell us. Here's how you love your enemies. I don't want to love my enemies. He's like, this is what it means to follow me. You got to love your enemies. I can't do that. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to, I'm going to move your heart so that you can, you can do that. He's going to teach us how to pray. I don't know how to pray. Jesus says, this is, this is basic Christianity. You got to learn how to pray. You know, here's, here's what fasting is. Fasting? I'm not fasting. No, this is basic Christianity. He talks about generosity. What's all mine? No, this is basic stuff. If you're going to follow Jesus, you've got to learn how to be generous. We all struggle with anxiety on whatever levels, especially in our culture today. Jesus in this sermon is going to tell us how to handle it, how to deal with it. Basic Christianity. If you're going to overcome anxiety, here's how you do it. You ever judge anybody else? Man, here's what you're supposed to do. Basic Christianity. And when you begin to do that, you begin to live like him, you figure out what the golden rule really is. You start to practice it. Now you're living like Jesus. Now you're living life on the mountain. Now you're experiencing the Beatitudes that we talked about the last couple of weeks. You're experiencing happiness and joy on a level that you've never experienced it. See, Jesus didn't just tell us to go love people, though. He didn't just say, hey, guys, y'all need to love people, so, you know, go figure it out. He showed us what love is. He showed us. He washed the disciples' feet the night he was going to be arrested. And then as he's arrested, he, he takes our sin to the cross, beaten, battered, bruised. He suffers a death that he did not deserve. He never committed a crime. He fulfilled the law perfectly. And as he is dying on the cross, he is breaking down the legalistic barriers that human beings build up to say, you got to do this to be holy. And he destroyed them. And he said, what is required of you is faith. Faith that I am the son of God, that I had died on the cross. I rose from the grave. And if you believe that, I will give you a new heart. What Jesus does is he says, look, I want you to remember what I've done. The night before he's arrested, he's gathered the disciples in a room, and they're eating dinner. And he says, look, guys, everything is about to change. And after I'm arrested and after I die, I want you to remember that everything has changed by gathering, taking some bread, taking some juice, some wine, and remembering that my body was broken. My body physically had to be killed so that you could be saved. My blood had to be spilled so that your sins could be atoned for. Your sins could be forgiven. And it's a beautiful picture. We call it communion. And every time we gather around the Lord's table, we are remembering the sacrifice that was given to us. We are remembering that everything has changed. We're remembering what sin did to our Savior. And we're remembering what love is calling us to do. Paul wrote it down in 1 Corinthians for us. He says, For I have received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. 
And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. For you and I, we're going to close our service today remembering and proclaiming the death of Jesus. And as we enter this time, I want you to do what the scripture tells us to do, which is to consider whatever sin is in our life and spend some time confessing sin and reestablishing that connection with the Lord, really thinking about where you're at with him. Remember, this is for those who have put their faith in Christ. If you've got a, a, a kid in here, maybe they've not done that. This is a great way to explain to them what the gospel really is. One point here. See, for the Pharisees, they were motivated by laws. I want to see the law, I want to see the box, and I'm going to check it. But what Jesus is calling you and I to be committed to is that he wants us to be motivated by love. He changes our heart. Now our motive is to love him. Our motive is to love others. And he grows that love within us. And we are to be known by our love for one another. So here's the final question today. Will you live like Jesus? Will you do it? Will you engage the next several weeks as we dive into what it really looks like to follow him and then begin to apply it to your life? Because following him is not a box to check. It's not a building to come to. It's a lifestyle to embrace, and it's a faith that lives in action that seeks to be motivated to love the Lord and to love others. I'm going to ask our section leaders to go ahead and begin to move and pass out the elements. As you receive it, let's enter this time um, as a time of prayer and a prayer that we would reconnect to our Savior. receive the bread and the juice. You can begin your time of prayer here at FC. We, you can do it several ways. The Bible never says how often to take the Lord's Supper. It just says to do it. And um, the way that we do it here is we just give you the, the freedom to take it on your own. And so the band is going to begin to play over us as we are spending this time with, with him. And then uh, after some time of everyone taking the bread and the juice, then we're going to close in a song. So let me pray and ask God's blessing upon this time. Father, Lord, we, we come into this moment with a spirit of worship and a heart that wants to honor you and please you. And Lord, we want to ask that in this time that we would in fact restore relationship with you by confessing sin in our life. We're thankful for the cross. We're thankful for the body that was broken, the blood that was spilled so that we could not only have eternal life, but we could have a right relationship with God, sins forgiven. Father, bless this time and we thank you for it. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 